Without a free press, there can be no government of the people, by the people, and for the people. We equally need an independent, impartial judiciary to defend both free speech and protect our rights and reputations. But how do we ensure that the two most important guardians who keep watch over our rulers on our behalf put our interests first instead of engaging in parochial turf wars? Welcome to Tarzan's Take. The proceedings of the petition against the outcome of the 2012 presidential election results have brought out major tensions between the media and the judiciary about their respective roles and limitations in a modern democratic society. Can the media say whatever it wants and however it wants to do so in its reportage of the court's proceedings? What constitutes fair comment and opinion? And when does this turn into prejudicial and contemptible conduct. Was the Supreme Court ad adjudication of the matter grounded in law, especially the laws of Ghana? And did the punishment fit the crime or did the court use a sledgehammer to crack a small nut when a gentle touch of his gavel would have been more appropriate? Have we learned any lessons from all of this? And if so, what are they? And how do we use them to deepen and enrich our democracy? Joining me tonight are Mr. Kabra Bleami here, Chairman of the National Media Commission, and Mr. Kofi Abuchi, Legal Practitioner and Senior Lecturer, Kempa Law School. Join us after a short break and watch our Wheat from Chap commentary, which sets the contest for tonight's discussion. <laughs> They mafu to some kakre wa supreme. The jailing of two media people for committing criminal contempt offenses in the ongoing election petition by the Supreme Court has shaken Ghana's media to its very foundations. Sadly, there is temperance, decorum, and caution in the style, tone, and assertiveness with which Ghana's media has been reporting the court's proceedings. The Supreme Court's decision to finally put down its gavel hat on an increasingly no-holds-barred media reportage and commentary of the case founded on a belief that these were not bound by any laws has been replaced by an almost timid reportage of verbatim exchanges devoid of spin or partisan biases. For the first time in Ghana's history, presenters and commentators are clearly and unambiguously disassociating themselves and their paymasters from the comments made by guests, as well as cautioning them about the need for circumspection, tact, and factual information. Unfortunately, and acting like wounded tigers, Ghana's media and some of their allies who believe they are the guardian angels and foremost promoters of free speech have jumped into the fray to denounce the Supreme Court's exercise as a dangerous attack on the rights given by our Constitution to protect the freedom and independence of the media. A vigorous and exciting debate has ensued as to whether the offense of contempt of court is being used as a crude hammer to bludgeon and suppress the expression of divergent views on the case, including expressing disagreement with and judgment on the decisions of the nine judges. A parallel debate is ranging on how the procedures and processes adopted by the court to consider and decide the guilt or otherwise of those who come before it. But my position is that our constitution takes from Britain and from the US, and we have an explicit Bill of Rights that guaranteed the right to speak. And because of that, certain common law offenses are automatically obs obsolete. Now, if you go to the constitution, let me read something for you in Article 162.4. 
editors and so on shall not be subject to control or interference nor shall they be penalized or harassed for their editorial opinions mm -hmm. well is this article in the constitution still in operation since ken crunchy is an editor and since he exercised an editorial opinion why is he being punished in spite of the clear command of article 1624 mm. we have to ask the question is the supreme court about the law the bar association on february 27 1995 embarked on a one-month boycott of the courts asked Interna amnesty international to adopt Mesa Bozo as a prisoner of conscience and indeed issued a 14-day ultimatum to Justice Aban, who had just around that time been made a chief justice, to resign. They referred to the fact that in the course of the proceedings, even three of his colleagues had acknowledged that indeed what was attributed to him as having a factual error done was correct. The judges haven't imposed on themselves or arrogated to themselves the powers of contempt. You must get that one clear. The powers of contempt have been invested in them by the Constitution. Constitution was made by the people of this country. We've all agreed that the judges should have a whip way to make sure that the administration of justice proceeds, you know, smoothly and fairly. Unfortunately, as with most public discourses that go on in Ghana, the debates have primarily been about personal opinions and wishes instead of being grounded firmly in Ghana's laws and related international conventions and practices. There are two broad kinds of contempt. There is what we call civil contempt and then there's criminal contempt. Civil contempt is where a court has given an order and a person disobeys the order. For example, the court grants an injunction to restrain you from entering a certain house. And having been served with the injunction, you still enter the house. Or having been aware of the injunction, you enter the house. There you have disobeyed an order of the court. And so you'll be held to be in civil contempt, disobedience of the court. Then there's criminal contempt. And that is when you haven't disobeyed an order of the court. In fact, there may be no order but you interfere with court proceedings or you do things that prejudice the outcome of the case or you show some other form of disrespect to the court. There are two kinds of that. There's contempt, what we call in facie courier, contempt in the face of the court. That is where, for instance, you get up in court and disturb or insult the judge or do something untoward within the precincts, the, the premises of the court, not only in the courtroom, but around the court. That's what we call contempt in the face of the court. Then there's contempt ex facie courier, contempt outside, completely outside the court. And that is where through your publications or your actions, you seek to interfere with the proceedings of the court or to scandalize the court. So if you write an article that, for instance, as we found, accuses the court of being hypocritical, then you are deemed to be guilty of one aspect of criminal contempt. So no, there's civil contempt, which is disobedience of a court order, and there's criminal contempt, which is largely interference in court proceedings, and that is divided into two. Contempt that happens in the face of the court, and contempt that happens outside the face of the court. Now we must understand that whatever the contempt is, the law says it is quasi-criminal. It is not criminal. It is civil in nature, but it has criminal, um, let's say criminal appearances, it's like half criminal, because proof is beyond, as we say, uh, technically beyond reasonable doubt, and then there's the likelihood of going to jail if you commit contempt of court. But the authorities are also to effect that contempt is strict liability. Strict liability means your intention does not matter. That I didn't intend to do it. It does not matter. If you're in contempt, you're in contempt. Your good faith, the truth of what you are doing, have all been held not to be relevant. So even if you thought you were doing good to the entire country, but you're in contempt, you're in contempt. Your good faith, your um, lack of intention, etc., may go towards reducing your punishment, but you are still in contempt. It is a strict liability offense. It can also arise by somebody applying to the court. So, okay, the question is how does the court know that somebody is in contempt? Any person may apply to the court that XYZ or Mr. Mansa or Ms. Mr. Mensa or Ms. Mansa has committed contempt of court, so they'll file a formal application. But the law also gives the court itself the power 
having learned that somebody has acted in, in, in contempt of the court, to summon the person on the court's own motion and put the person before him and say, show cause why you should not be convicted and punished for contempt. And that is where I think a lot, a lot of people are surprised. They say, is the, is the court its own prosecutor and its own judge? You may have a problem with it, but the law says that the courts themselves have the power without any application to summon somebody. So if the judge reads an article about something that is going on in his or her court, he can summon, or he or she can summon the journalist to the court and say, show cause why I should not convict and punish you for being in contempt of my court. You may, it may seem unfair. You may say that the person, the judge in the court is a, is, a, is, a court, is, a, is a judge in his own course. And maybe we should look at it again. But that is the state of the law. Having said that, so, so far, with what has happened in the Supreme Court, I, on, in law, do not have a single complaint in law. Legally, it is all in line with the law. But we need to ask ourselves questions. Is this how we need to keep the law on contempt? This is 12th century law which has evolved from England all of these years and we received it in Ghana. Should this still be kept in that same pristine common law tradition or is there time for change? And that is why some of us are saying we should start looking at a local legislation on contempt. The International Covenant on Civil and Political Rights, ICCPR, has defined three critical criteria to determine when there has been interference in the administration of justice that can constitute criminal contempt. Firstly, the interference must be provided for by law. The law must be accessible and formulated with sufficient precision to enable the citizen to regulate his conduct. Secondly, the interference must pursue one of the legitimate aims listed in Article 19, Section 3. Thirdly, the interference must be necessary to secure that. In the United Kingdom, Australia and New Zealand, the common law test of liability requires a real risk as opposed to a remote possibility that public confidence in the judicial system would be undermined. By contrast, in the United States, the offense of scandalizing the court has been limited in application for several decades. The Supreme Court has made it clear in a series of cases that the publication must create a clear and present danger to the administration of justice. The Canadian position is now very close, if not parallel to the American position. However, the European Court of Human Rights has considered at least three cases dealing with offenses similar to scandalizing the court. In all three cases, the court held that the restriction was prescribed by law and had a legitimate aim. Maintaining the authority of the judiciary, the court has held that the restriction on freedom of expression is necessary in a democratic society, reasoning that the state had a legitimate interest in protecting the reputation of judges. The ICCPR and its sister protocols, the European Convention on Human Rights ECHR, the American Convention on Human Rights ACHR, and the African Charter on Human and People's Rights ACHPR, all protect both freedom of expression and the administration of justice. Article 19 of the ICCPR protects freedom of expression as follows. 1. Everyone should have the right to hold opinions without interference. 2. Everyone shall have the right to freedom of expression. This right shall include freedom to seek, receive and impart information and ideas of all kinds, regardless of frontiers, either orally, in writing or in print, in the form of art or through any other media of its choice. However, Article 19.3 of the ICCPR also states the exercise of the rights provided for in paragraph 2 of this article carries with it special duties and responsibilities. It may therefore be subject to certain restrictions 
but these shall only be such as are provided by law and are necessary. A. For respect of the rights and reputations of others. B. For the protection of national security or of public order or of public health or morals. Almost identical replication in Article 164 of Ghana's Constitution. It does appear that the certainty and assuredness that has characterized the positioning by the proponents of fatal attack on free speech versus the law lies in the bosom of the court on the matter of criminal contempt may not be as clear-cut as either side may wish Ghanaians to believe. Therefore, if we are to bring clarity and a better appreciation about the rules and limitation of two most important of the four pillars that protect our democracy and freedoms, our conversation must be grounded on what the laws of Ghana prescribe aided by the obligations of the international rules and conventions that we have signed on to. This is how we will assure rational, informed and above all, productive dialogue that moves our nation forward in peace and with a common purpose of unity and respect for the rule of law. <laughs> Welcome. We've had a very interesting discussion about freedom of the press in relation to the contempt of court. Now let's try to indigenize this discussion in the context of what has taken place recently and where we want to go from here. Welcome, Cabral, and welcome, Kofi. Thanks. Thank you. Thanks. Cabral, let me start with you, uh, given that free speech is the opening gambit of our Thing. You've been a practicing journalist, you've been an editor, you've headed the Ghana Journalist Association, and now you are the judge of the media in Ghana. Let me start off by asking you, is Kofi Asari's prescription of 164, uh, or was it 1624, does it give an unfettered right for journalists to do as they please? Well, uh, let me begin by thanking you for, for the opportunity and commend you for, for, the, for, this, uh, for this initiative. Uh, in the primary interview, you know, discussions, there was a talk about uh, debate. I'm not sure there's any serious uh, informed and structured debate. So your platform provides uh, an occasion for, for the process, for the conversation. I, 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 I want to say that uh, since this uh, issue image. There's been all kind of uh, discussions, and uh, you can see clearly two schools of thought. Yeah. Uh, the bar association, uh, a couple of lawyers in this country, uh, of the view that the Supreme Court was exercising its uh, uh, right in what it did in the case of uh, Atubiga and uh, uh, Ken Crunchy, and there's the other school of thought uh, led by. Uh, Professor and uh, uh, Prempe, all based in the U.S. And I think uh, locally, um, Kisi Ajabine, a law lecturer mm. at, at, uh, at Legon, uh, which clearly seeks to uh, stress the point uh, as outlined by Professor And I, I, I believe that um, he is not far from wrong. Um, what he's saying, uh, in my view, is what the Constitution it's saying that for people's uh, or editors' right to exercise their, their opinions and uh, the content of their publications, they should not be penalized. And, and I think uh, he's uh, but right. But that's a suggestion of uh, that their rights are unfettered, that they can injure any, anybody's uh, reputation. Uh, certainly not, of, because uh, in this country we have uh, all kinds of uh, uh, limitations, so libel and the rest. Now, if you're talking about uh, the contempt law, it seeks to protect the integrity, the reputation of our courts. And in exercising that uh, protection, it, it may be so balanced as to ensure that 
uh, the fear of, of, of the courts are not put uh, in, 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 in the Camera, but 1624 list. talks about interference by government. It does not talk about interference by the judiciary or well, other arms of the... Well, uh, let, let's stretch the, the, the debate. Yes. We have an elected executive. And as it, were, as it is today, uh, per the repeal of the criminal libel law, they are more or less uh, leaving themselves free to all kinds of attack. And I think if any institution should be protected, it should be the presidency, it should be the executive. Mm -hmm. uh, what I'm not saying that they should be unfettered uh, because as, as the Article 19 says, there might be some uh, limitations. limitation or obligation and responsibility on the part of the media. And, and so I'm, I'm not arguing for uh, alliances and, and unlimited frontiers for the media to, to abuse the, the reputation of uh, uh, others. But when you have a situation where even the executive has so opened itself to attacks, then you know, uh, the judiciary, much as we want to protect its reputation and integrity, uh, should, in exercising the, the, the contempt law, do in such a way as not to penalize uh, people for their uh, uh, expressions of views and opinions. Uh, I think that there, there are many, I have, you know, it's, it's, it's just sad that some of these things are lost. As far back as May 21st, when I was swearing the, the three members of the media, when they were being sworn in at the Supreme Court, I used the occasion to advise the media to go by the rules of covering uh, court proceedings, which is very simple. You, you have to be fair, uh, truthful, and accurate. You cannot uh, imagine, you know, you, you can't report a court case out of your own imagination. So for as long as you are reporting verbatim what happens in courts, you are, you are covered. And I think in this particular case, we need to look at uh, a certain aspect of, of, of the, 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 the debate or the discussion. Let me, let me bring Kofi in here because mm -hmm. Clearly, from the media perspective, you think uh, uh, this, this is uh, the position. But over here we are, uh, where the court, in effect, has said that the commentary by the gentleman was an attempt, in a sense, to make it difficult, an interference in the administrative of justice, administration of justice, yeah, and I, therefore I, constituted contempt. I, I wanted to bring in an element, maybe you can comment on yeah, that. Yeah. There are two issues in this case, or two commentaries. One was by a political uh, activist who was saying that uh, th there will be, be war if uh, the ruling went a certain way. And there was a, an, 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 an editorial person making a comment. So you have to make a distinction between, between the two issues that were brought before the Yeah, but the comment course. specifically said that the court was being biased, which I will let Kofi take off from there because in my small understanding of the law of contempt, you know, the issue of scandalizing the court and interfering in the administration of justice by suggesting bias, etc. Kofi, you, you come in here and let's elaborate this matter for us because it's right. important. Right, it's important. Thank you very much. Um, I think um, I would totally understand the position of my senior friend, uh, Mr. Amihir, because coming from where he's coming from, he has an industry to protect, and, and that is the media. I'm not sure uh, I want to put it in industry. <laughs> well, industry in quotes, not really. But you know, he has a certain constituency to protect, so I can understand his sentiments in this regard. But moving on from this point, I think the question is what the law is. And yes. I think we have a difficulty here, because not only would I have to speak to what the law is, but we actually, as he indicated earlier, we have a split front as far as the legal fraternity is concerned as to what the position of the law is, as far as uh, whether it's even feasible for us to continue that. I would first of all just want to start with whether or not um, it's even necessary, because I think that's the tape he played earlier. And I've had, I've had discussions from um, you know, very respected senior friends like uh, Mr. Izankoma and uh, Professor Asari. The argument, and I think it's important for us to put things in proper perspective, I would respectfully disagree that there has been an abolishment of contempt in the various jurisdictions that have been mentioned, the US, Canada, the UK, etc. In fact, in the case of the UK, 
the Law Commission has made presentation of proposals for amendment and the Bar Council of the UK has made comments in respect of areas that it actually agrees with for purposes of abolishment. There has never been a full proposal for a complete abolishment of the regime of contempt. This then brings me to the question of the necessity of contempt. Do we need the court to be protected in respect of statements that are made in respect of the court? What is secret about the administration of justice that necessitates the protection of that particular venture from even scandalizing comments. I think if we understand this from this perspective, probably we can have a much more informed uh, discussion. My position respectfully on this matter is this. I think that the administration of justice and the authority of the court is what makes the court the court. Throughout history, constitutional scholars have referred to the court as the least dangerous branch. Not the fact that it is not dangerous at all. It is dangerous, the but it is the least of the dangerous. So of the three branches of government, this is the least dangerous. The reason it is the least dangerous, it has been said, is because if you look at the various branches, the legislature and the executive, they all have what, has, what can metaphorically be referred to as the sword. You know, they can do wrong things. The PDA was passed by a legislature, yes. and we all know the, what, what happened. Exactly. The PDA was initially mooted by the executive, and <laughs> we all know what happened. It was used by the executive. What PDA did you, being the Prevent, uh, Preventive Detention, Detention Act, Act. Thank you. Which was passed right. by Cabral's people. <laughs> <laughs> right. You know, and we, we all know what happened. Well, if, <laughs> you can come in and tell you. Well, there, were, there were circumstances, circumstances <laughs> leading beyond to that. Control. All right. Just like uh, we are dealing with uh, the fight against terrorism, where all kinds of laws are being put in place to, <laughs> to protect the, right. the security right. of, uh, of uh, nations state. and people. Exactly. In that dynamic, we know that what the court did was to, so, was to, so to speak, legitimize the PDA. So in the, th in the triumvirate dynamic, the court merely had a shield. The two organs had the sword, the capacity to do evil. The court can merely say what the law is, and in the process, be merely as best, at best defend uh, the position of the law. So in this respect, the point I'm just trying to draw, uh, the conclusion I'm trying to draw, is that if you look at the various organs, the court has traditionally been the least of the organs in terms of its capacity and propensity to do evil. But don't we, but we regard the court as a, a referee which is going to protect everybody's interests. And therefore, isn't it necessary <coughs> to protect the integrity of the court and not subject it to ridicule? Precisely so. Precisely so. One of the most delicate things that, are, um, that lawyers and the courts and the law generally is concerned about is the need to maintain and preserve the image and integrity of the court. Because if the court loses its integrity, the en entire political um, regime is in danger. Because if we can't be sure of settling our matter in the court, we settle it on the streets. I think the reason why the authority of the court is so important for preservation purposes is precisely because we want to ensure that there's a final arbiter who can speak with authority what it means is that if that authority, if for whatever reason, disrespected, that authority must have the capacity to punish for the disrespect. I think that is the essence of the, of, of the offense of contempt of court. And for those, and I think Professor Asari uh, was earlier making the point that it's a common law offense. And I think uh, Isan Kumar actually supported that to an extent. It has moved beyond a common law offense. It is actually a statutory and constitutional offense. Article 126 clearly states the fact that Contempt of the, the Supreme Court has the capacity to punish for yes. contempt. And indeed, uh, the High Court Civil Procedure Rules under what is called Order 50 has maintained and preserved the offense of contempt and has gone ahead to specify the modality for administering justice whenever someone is being committed um, uh, under the offense. Those people who have argued that the court is a judge, the Jury. prosecutor, everybody, I can understand that. But I think uh, my answer to that is when water chokes, you have a difficulty in washing it down. Yeah. You still have to use water. Yes, go on. First of all, I think that um, uh, Kofi was saying that I was uh, speaking to my constituency or for my constituency. I could say the same thing about, about, about him. <laughs> but I think when it comes to free speech, it's not f just for media people. After all, Tubiga is not a journalist. So it, it's, it's a right that on the Article 19 is for every citizen. Uh, I also want to say that... Um, if you go back to 1968, when there was a, a similar contempt case, yes. uh, Liberty, the state versus Liberty, Liberty Press, Press yeah. the then chief judge, uh, Edward Akufuado, 
you know, said, among other things, that the courts are not above criticism. And I think this is the position that, this is the issue that is at stake, that in protecting the integrity and the reputation of the courts, where they err, and to err is human. Should they be... Are you suggesting that the court erred? No, I'm not saying, I say the courts can err. They are human institutions. Yeah, yeah, that's acceptable. Yeah, you know, but so I mean, if we ground ourselves in the in the particular cases. No, no. Well, well I'm making yeah. a general statement okay. because when uh, Jesse Kufuado said that the courts are not above criticism, he was alluding to the fact that it is possible for for uh, judgments you know, to be to 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 be, to be faulted, and when that happens, I think that the, the citizenry has has a right uh, to criticize, and I think he made a reference to Abuchi made a reference to. Uh, Asari's take on, on, mm. on the, uh, the, the law of contempt. And I think in one of his writings, I mean, he argues that per an act of 2013, the, the law of contempt has become obsolete in the UK. Of course, all these things are subject to interpretations. Well, what is, it doesn't become obsolete. And in, 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 if I may quote... If his, I'm, his application is... No, if I may quote yeah, him. Yeah. He says, scandalism... The, the court. court as a criminal offense, while very much alive in the Supreme Court of Ghana, is officially dead in the country of its origin. Its remains are interred as clause 22 of the Crime and Courts Act 2013, which proclaims that scandalizing the, court, the judiciary, also referred to as scandalizing the courts or judges, is abolished as a form of contempt of court under the common law of England and Wales. Yeah, but England's law is subjected to the European, no, no. So, to the European law. No, the no, European so. law actually has reinforced. I think what is happening in, 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 in Europe, and maybe probably in America, yeah. more in America than Europe, is the fact that they recognize the law, but they don't see uh, that you should bring a sledgehammer. That's what they talk about clear and present danger. But, but I believe that the issue at stake Yes. It's hard to have a balance as this uh, program seeks to We are to, trying to, to get a balance, strike. yes. And that means looking at whatever provisions are in the Constitution, what exists in the uh, Universal uh, uh, Declaration, and ensure that the media or citizens who, which uh, contribute to discussions do so with a sense of responsibility. And understanding. W you know, I, I don't think that uh, uh, se a sentencing journalist to, to, to prison or oh, we'll come to that one but is, is a solution no no what I'm saying here I mean my understanding of this was, was this you're in the middle of a case a trial yeah. a petition hearing mm -hmm. and in you know I, what the way I understood Akufuadu's um, opinion was on a judgment a judgment has been delivered yeah and then or about to be delivered. Or, yeah. Or, I think that is has been delivered. Come in there if you want. Right. I mean, if I may just um, interject, I think that what m Mr. Justice Edward Akuford was actually talking about, which is a standard position worldwide, is that scholarly critique of judgment and intellectual objective critique of judgment are not about uh, are are not contempt offenses oh, no, at all. No, no, they agree with you. No, I, correct. Yeah, that, that, I agree and I totally you. agree with you on that. That's actually yes. what he meant. No, but what we saw in the, in the recent case was that people were making political uh, No, Cabral, uh, no. You see, if somebody says yeah. judges are likely to be prejudiced or biased, these are the words that were used. No, I'm, I'm, I'm even uh, making a general statement yeah. that in all the commentaries on the, uh, the ongoing case, People went beyond informed uh, opinions. Uh, it was very pedestrian. Yes. Uh, very politicized. So somebody on one side, you know, will make Ooh. a statement. You know, that cannot be uh, justified or defended. And I'm, I'm, I'm against that because, you know, as I said uh, earlier on, when it comes to covering court proceedings, you need to make a distinction. You don't inject, because judges should be allowed to judge cases. What we saw in recent times was that people were trying to judge the case on the behalf case. of yes. that one is totally wrong, and I've argued against that. Let's leave it. We should not raise expectations, and in many instances, politicians were on the different uh, levels they were raising expectations, which was obviously going to contribute to. Uh, L let me uh, take crisis. off from what, what you've just said and bring Kofi in here because what I found very curious about, about all these proceedings were the spokespersons of the various sides 
essentially spinning the debates at the end of each day. And I, I found it very difficult to see whether, in fact, the, the general public were getting a fair analysis of what had gone on in the day, where we're just being spun to expect certain um, positions. Correct. I mean, skewed and polarized discussions, especially in a manner that tends to prejudice the proceedings, in a manner that discusses factual and evidential issues before the court, in a manner that, as it were, puts some sort of pressure on the judges, has never been tolerated anywhere in the world. And indeed, for those who are suggesting that in countries like America they've abolished this, they have other mechanisms. If America hasn't officially abolished it, lower courts tend to apply it, but the Supreme Court has never applied it. <coughs> and the reason, twofold, first of all, this is a country that has evolved over 300 years. The institutions are solid, and I think the American Supreme Court, no president, no government, would dare undermine its decisions. In Ghana, without mentioning governments, I think we all know that judgments have been rendered by the Supreme Court in Ghana, and they have either been implemented with um, a certain, a, you know, they've been, they've been implemented with a certain lackadaisical like, attitude, or they've been altogether avoided. So, in this country, we are still evolving in a manner that advises or counsels us against allowing the public, so to speak, to stampede the courts uh, in, in their decision making in a particular direction. But I think also uh, going on in, the, in, the, in this particular area, one can say, the statement that a judge is biased or could potentially be biased is in itself not a legally wrongful statement to make. It's allowed. And people raise objections against judges sitting on particular cases every time. It happens all the time. Proud to the case Proud happening. to the case coming up in the middle of the case happening. You have the right to raise an objection against a judge's bias or objective tendency. However, the reason the court might have taken this posture, and I think I understand the court, on this particular occasion is because the matter is not being raised officially before the court. The matter is being raised extrajudicially and in a manner the courts cannot respond to. I think we need to also be mindful of the fact that the courts are not in the business of responding to media issues. So they can't come and say what A, a said or B said is wrong or right. They don't do that. It is totally a judicial. It's not something in the nature of their but training But if they can't say that, how can they say it's contempt? How can they what, go on? What they can't say, what they can't speak to, they can act towards. And so what they do is basically to invite you to come to, come to the courts. Because under Article 126 and under Order 50, the combined effect of these two provisions is that the court has the power to bring you before it. And now listen, the phrasing by the law, the phraseology in the law is for you to show cause why you, you ought not to be punished okay. for contempt. Cabral, let me, you are now sitting in the chair of the National Media Commission. Yeah. And I feel in many ways you are emasculated in terms of dealing especially with the, the media's injury to personal reputations. Because on two occasions, firstly, when John Mahama was Minister of uh, Information or Communications, mm -hmm. he tried to bring in a delayed uh, mechanism to ensure that people would not, in a sense, uh, make scurrilous remarks uh, and that they could be taken off. And then I remember when um, Akufuor was Attorney General, he tried to pass legislative instruments that would have given teeth to the Media Commission in terms of its adjudication of um, complaints by, 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 by people against their reputations being injured. In both cases, Ghana's media shut them down because they th saw them as attacks on the freedom of the press. Sitting where you are now, as chairman hmm. of the commission, reflect on it and let's see. Well, I, well, I think that, we, first of all, you need to look at the, the legal framework or the consumer framework, mm -hmm. uh, what Ghanaians uh, chose or opted for when they voted for the constitution. They opted for a very libertarian line that uh, literally open the floodgates uh, for what we see uh, today. And secondly, you need to consider uh, the issue of frequency, frequency allocation. Mm. It's been done in such a manner that, as we speak, there are about 300 authorized... 275 actually in operation. Yes, authorized FM stations. And in, in, in uh, opening the airwaves uh, after the unsuccessful, uh, or the, the, the saga of uh, Radio I, we didn't put in place 
a, a, a legal framework. We don't have a broadcasting law, no law in this country, and for years, you know, we've been struggling to bring it in, in, into place. So we have a a, a, a duality of uh, existence where the NMC, uh, the NCA, allocates frequency, but cannot control content. The NMC controls content, but has no say in the allocation of, of, of frequency. No, but let me read, let, let me read you, your, you know, because I, I printed today the, the chapter 12. Okay. 1672 says, the NMC must take all appropriate measures to ensure the establishment and maintenance of the highest journalistic standards in the mass media, including the investigation, mediation, and settlement of complaints made against or by the press or other mass media. What I do know, for example, is that the obligation to publish rejoin this and give them the same level of prominence as attacks made by it's not even obeyed well, and and this 167b no, no, when, has when, no legal no when, when it comes to attention we are able to enforce it but i think on, on a broader front when it comes to radio for instance mm. the fact that you have two uh, bodies you know in charge of, of, of the landscape doesn't augur well for the kind of efficiency uh, effectiveness and responsible joint that we we, we, we we want. But we are working towards that. And I'm sure in the in the coming months and weeks we will be in a position to ensure that uh, there's a realignment uh, of purpose in this regard. But um, when you say that as as we used to say that uh, NMC uh, lags the teeth to bite, it's because you created a, a constitutional framework that sought to uh, exactly do what we are, uh, the position we find ourselves in. But after 20 years of, uh, of uh, this uh, experiment, I think the time has come, and Ghanaians are asking for uh, some levels of uh, sanctions that to bring sanity into the, into the system. I, I believe that uh, we always keep referring to the US. Uh, the US is a, an area where you can see there are unlimited frontiers in, 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 in line with their Western uh, frontier spirit where there are few limitations and the u.s has not fallen down or crumbled because there's so much freedom i believe that the onus rest no 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 but those those there are a lot of freedoms but there are also serious laws against injuring people's reputation no, but, 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 an obstruction of no, justice no no but if you take a uh, where one's reputation is injured mm. we, are, we still have the civil libel laws and people have invoked those laws and won uh, cases against uh, Iran journalists. So it's not as if our journalists have all the, the freedoms in the world, you know, to... to, to, to Kofi, let me take your view on... on, on yeah, because I, I can chapter cite... Chapter 12. First and of all, I'm not an anti-media person no, at all. No. So if, if my discussion is coming across uh, as such... It uh, is not. It's not coming I, across. I want it, we want, wonderful, we want, wonderful. It's not coming yeah. across that. Wonderful. But I think we've got to be pragmatic in some of the issues. And I, I, again, I did not say that earlier, that you represent a constituency with a negative impression. Um, just to state the obvious, that we have come a certain way in this country. And I think our history dictates that sometimes when these rights are being eroded, we are conscious and careful yeah. because when they are eroded, they are difficult to bring back or to expand. And so I can understand some of the sentiments and the difficulties that we're dealing with. Having just said that, I'm just saying, I think I'll just, um, you know, right from where he ended because you, you requested it. Yes. Um, the question is, given the example of the U.S., for instance, when it comes to the issue of when a person's rights are trampled upon because um, he's been injured by reason of, let's say, a scandalizing publication, the cost of prosecuting your rights in this country is expensive. And not only in financial terms, but expensive in other <coughs> terms, like, t like time. Like the fact that you may never even live to see the end of, uh, the, 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 that the case may not uh, live to see the light of day. That, you know, the, the case will take forever in court. Uh, you may not have enough money to even hire the services of a lawyer, among other reasons. I think the point I'm just making is that while I understand that it is important to expand the frontiers of these rights, it is also important to understand, or we should understand, the fact that our peculiar or our peculiarities in this country, in this country dictates um, you know, certain understandings as well, such as the fact that if we're allowing people to come out with all kinds of publications, especially affecting judicial proceedings like this, the potential that certain judges sometimes might be stampeded in one particular direction or the other because of the political climate that is created 
because of the public expectations and pressure, their very uh, safety and security is even at stake as far as this case is concerned. And then you have people making statements that are warmongering. You have people making statements that suggest bias, not coming before the court directly. And then you have media houses that are picking up at the back of these statements and making publications. I think the second publication in respect of the, uh, the bias, the judges might have probably been found that more offensive, particularly because they had just punished Sorry. the original maker of the statement. So it created a certain sense of impunity. It was as if to say, you have punished the one who made a statement, but we're even going to give you further publication. Courts are very careful to demonstrate their capacity to come down on this, because if they don't, they create an impression of impotence in the mind of the public. And that is more dangerous and risky, because if people think that, frankly, you can speak of this court in any manner, and frankly get away with that, you create yeah. You dilute the authority of the but court and moving forward. Well, and I think you, are, you are speaking for the judiciary. Uh, let me uh, <laughs> ask the question I asked before. Yeah. Who protects the executive? Because it's, it's also a very important no. institution. And so if we are so concerned about protecting the judiciary. Well, I can tell you. <laughs> the executive, the executive, yes, they, because they have, no, they have the full there arsenal. arsenal. The executive has the full arsenal. Yeah. Mr. Yeah. Ambassador, uh, mm -hmm. blame me here. As we sit here. No, but if I, I may help you on this yes. matter, okay. the answer, yes. you know, like, I, I believe that when we were celebrating the 10th anniversary of the repeal of criminal labor law, yeah. uh, President Kufo was asked, do you regret repealing the law? He said, I, I don't have no regrets. Mm -hmm. Although I was a target of so many attacks, and if I'd, I had uh, retained the status quo, I could have invoked what is in the law, because we are talking about the law. Right. The same law that was used to uh, punish uh, Azikwe and uh, Bankoli Timothy mm -hmm. for questioning whether the, uh, uh, the African also has a God. So if we are so concerned about protecting the judiciary, my question is that... I don't, I don't think we are concerned about protecting no, no, the because judiciary. Because that, that is what the case is uh, uh, bringing no, I up. I don't think so. I, don't think I, I, I think it's a distorted question it's that we put out there. No, but even if it's beyond that, yes. how should uh, the, the executive yeah, be protected? My answer to that is simple. Yes. First of all, the executive has the full arsenal and armory of state, state uh, power. power to protect itself. As we see, let me just well, give a classic, how does he do it? Well, let me just give a classic example. Yeah. People sometimes, you know, come up with this artificial distinction between the police and the government. And the government. It's an artificial thing because the reality will never happen. Um, but there's no, there's, it's artificial in well, the sense that the constitution has put all of the executive authority of Ghana in the, the hands of the president. But what so I'm saying here is that <laughs> in, in previous times, an article against the wife of a president, mm -hmm. which was, was, was deemed offensive, you know, but could have but no, but no, I think I think you should understand the, the context of this discussion, right. because you know, well, I, I'm me, no, 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 me, no, no, me, <laughs> sitting here, yeah. I put my life down for press freedom, okay, yeah. but the issue we are discussing is, has it gone too far to the extent that it thinks right. that it is above the law, it is unfettered. You well, know, well, what, what does, does one of the true. reasons why I'm... Is that, well, let me, I, I have let, an answer to let that. Let me be very cynical. Yeah. You said people have won judgments. Most of those judgments were not enforced. But in our opening um, commentary, we showed the huge soberness in the coverage of the press since this unfortunate thing happened. Soberness in the sense that what you preached about reportage in court is not the norm. What does, that, what does that tell you? Well, there's a simple solution. <laughs> the solution is that the media it should be guided by the code of ethics. They should be more responsible. I mean, since I became chairman of the Media Commission, I have been the first to warn journalists that if you abuse the freedoms you enjoy today, the same society that gave us the freedoms will vote them back. And I think that when the present commission, President Mahama commissioned graphic, he was generous enough to quote what I said. When I said it, it didn't register in the minds of, 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 of journalists. Yeah, Kofi, you, you're going to come in with... No, I was just going to speak earlier to who protects the executive. Yeah. Yes. And indeed, I'll further add who protects the legislature. And given the example of the police, mm -hmm. that as we sit here, nothing stops even the police from picking any of us on set. The arrest may turn out to be unlawful. The charges may turn out to be trumped. Everything may turn out to be completely you know, fabricated. But in the end, the police are within their power to do that. In other words, 
the state power, and I think Ambassador Blamia yeah. knows that more than I do. He was part of the state power. I, mean, well, I was well. never. He's an ambassador. <laughs> I was never. Well. Well. I was never. <laughs> <I was laughs> <ever. laughs> but yeah. the whole paraphernalia of state power is at the disposal and the behest of the executive. We've got a, a few more minutes, but let me tackle two very specific uh, areas. There's a debate as to whether the court had the power to act the way it did. I know you hinted about the fact that it did. And then Cabral also brought in the issue, as, which I also raised in one of the questions. Did the punishment really fit the crime? If I could get your takes on those, and then we can look forward to the future. Well, per, per the existing law, uh, which he, he will refer to, then they were acting within the... Uh, the, the no, but y you know, um, in, in the advanced jurisdictions, they, they talk about whether the offense is going to create a clear and present danger. Did we see this in the same way in terms of how, in effect, hmm. the punishment of jailing them? <laughs> could, they, could they also have been just uh, sort of said, okay, look, well, I, slap I, on the hand? I think that there's, uh, Professor Gajipu mm. has a take on this mm. matter that uh, probably the systems of the NMC should be so strengthened that where we have such cases, the matter could be referred to the NMC. Yes, as in the case of uh, the uh, Watavi case, mm. when it was uh, deemed that some, uh, some lawyers didn't conduct themselves well, they have referred the matter. Uh, yeah, yeah, you know, so yeah. that, 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 that's a good point uh, to start so off because we, we have to yeah. start running, winding up. Well, what, are the le uh, what are the lessons? How should we be seen? How do we ensure that we maintain that balance between... Um, because at, at, at the end of the day, these are our guardians of the people's uh, rights and freedoms. So how do we go forward to ensure that, you know, we achieve some kind of uh, synergy amongst the rather than fights? My, yes. my take on this matter is that uh, our, our, our courts should be allowed to perform their work. And that means that we should not, as a media, be judges in cases that are beyond our jurisdiction. And we should not allow um, our platforms to be used by politicians you know, to prejudge cases. I think what we have seen in this uh, case is that the media, in an attempt to uh, increase their listenership or boost their sales, allow their platforms to be used. Yeah. And that's why we find ourselves in this situation. If you abide by the golden rules of, of, of the profession, you will not get into this trouble. It's a question of presentation, how to you know, insult would I even been seen as insulting somebody. <laughs> yeah. Yes. No, I think the law is clear. I think if there's anything I take out of this case moving forward, what I would suggest is that when a court thinks that there's contempt committed in respect of it, for purposes of boosting and reinforcing the perception of neutrality, objectivity, and fairness, that court, if it's a higher court, should remit the matter to a lower court for trial. Because that, you know, the question of becoming a judge in your own yeah, course, true, yeah. it's a fundamental principle the court and the judiciary is against. And so when a court such as the Supreme Court thinks that um, someone has acted in a manner that scandalizes or that has, um, that has brought it into contempt and wants to commit the person for contempt, I think that the Supreme Court may be in its right, uh, you know, in its right action, basically, so to speak, to refer the matter to, say, a high court for trial. And that matter could have been going on contemporaneously with the Supreme Court matter. And I think just to boost and reinforce the perception that indeed the court has not prejudged and is basically just giving you a public impression of saying something when indeed it has decided the matter. I think moving forward, the, 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 the law itself is clear. Scholarly critique, objective critique, factual discussion of cases that are not intended. And I'll just make a last comment because um, as Ankuma said something here earlier, uh, TP play, that indeed when it comes to contempt, the mindset and the mens rea, what lawyers call mens rea, is not material. I respectfully agree with him, but I think it is a bit narrow the way he stated it. The court still considers the question of mindset. That is why the phraseology of the law is to the effect that you have to show reason why you ought not. And so you come before the court and you, are, you can actually speak. In fact, that's the only time you are a judge guilty before. Well, in essence. <laughs> in essence. In a, well, in yeah. essence. But, yeah. but in this particular case, <laughs> even though you may not the court may not forgive you, for having a good intention in whatever you've done. 
I agree with him to the extent that indeed your mens rea or your mindset can go substantially to the effect uh, to, to to the question of punishment that is meted out to you. If Thank not you both very much. This has been a very exciting discussion, and I'm almost, I'm almost tempted to say we should uh, we should continue this discussion at a future date. Uh, Clearly, um, is it over? Absolutely. Well, we'll come back. We'll come back to this discussion. That's what happens when you're having a very um, I I interesting and measured, but also very uh, thoughtful discussion. Well, I don't think we have exhausted the subject, but at least I think we brought some clarity into this whole issue. Press freedom is essential. Respect for the judiciary to ensure that we can go before them and treat them as honest brokers is also a must if we are to defend our democratic principles. Perhaps what we've learned from all of this is that sometimes we need to ensure that where punishments are invoked, which put bricks on certain bad actions, we should reflect and think whether those punishments are appropriate, and if they are not appropriate, look forward to ensuring that the protections we desire for the freedoms that we've been given by our constitution are protections which respect the rights of every one of us and the reputations of every one of us as well. Thank you very much for watching or listening to Tarzan's take tonight. We'll be back next week with our final take for the first and the premier season of Tarzan's take.